alive, you are alive. Good morning and welcome to the Sunrise Safari on this glorious winter's morning out here in the African bush. We are coming to you live from Juma, Arethusa and Cheetah Plains Game Reserve in the Sabi Sand in the Greater Kruger National Park of South Africa. My name is Jamie and I'm back from leave and thrilled to be back from leave and reunited once again with Brian who is on camera with me this morning. We have a special treat planned for you because I believe the fantastic Steph is out on a vehicle, lo and behold, and Mr. Hendry is on foot. So we have all kinds of wonderful things planned for you. Uh, you can see we're all wrapped up like we're heading off into sort of sub-arctic temperature conditions. That's because we're South African, and as South Africans, we're not quite built to deal with the cold. Even though it's only around 11 degrees this morning, which is 50, what's it again, 51 odd Fahrenheit, not too chilly at all, it still feels pretty cold when you're sitting here on the vehicle. Now don't forget that you can ask questions and you can do that on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or you can email through to questions at wildearth.tv and what that means is that it's essentially a fantastically interactive safari experience almost like you're on the back of the vehicle with us if you were on the back of the vehicle you would get to see how Brian is dressed this morning he is um, <laughs> he's, he, he's mostly just eyes and and hands that's that's all I can see of Brian <laughs> just one tall shape covered in many many layers that being said he does of course have to bear the brunt of the wind chill factor that flows over the top of the vehicle Right, so plan for this morning, we've come through to where Karula was last seen with her cubs. Apparently she had a Nyala kill, not too far from where I am now. Uh, James said to me that he thought that she'd be gone by this morning, just because the Nyala that she managed to catch was very small, so it was pretty much all gone by the end of yesterday's sunset safari. And I think I'm going to take his word for it, because while I'm driving along here, all I'm seeing is not leopard tracks, but hyena tracks wandering through. So the hyenas have come to pay Karula's kill, at least, a visit. Let's just double check along here. Because in here, Brian's just telling me exactly where the kill was. I just want to double check. Yeah, the hyenas have definitely been through. Was to be expected. Just trying to see where the off-road tracks have gone. Maybe we can investigate. Let's go further forward. So she picked a spot right in the drainage line around a road called Ingwe Alley. Ingwe, of course, being the word for leopard in the local language. Here we go. There's vehicle tracks coming in here. And we're going to go check. We're going to see if Karula's stick, stuck around. Sticked around. Sticked around is definitely not the past tense of stick stuck around Juma or if she's moved off further south so while we investigate the site of the kill let's head across to Steph find out what his plans are for the morning good morning good morning to everybody and you've caught me and cameraman on the on the job today is David and uh, we are on our way to Cheetah Plains for a bit of an extraordinary um, adventure. I have never been to Cheetah Plains in terms of game driving before and so you're going to be coming with me today on uh, one of these let's turn left, let's turn right expeditions that generally are actually quite productive for me to be quite honest. When things are at their most chaotic or tend to be at their uh, unplanned for instance, I, I seem to have luck like that. that. That is where my luck lies. Unlike our dear friend Brent Leo Smith who works very hard at producing his own luck, I have to survive on the universe's good graces but we've just checked treehouse we've been uh, having a look around this morning we've managed to go past treehouse dam already not too much sign over there there's some old lion tracks that come into this area very fresh hippopotamus tracks i don't think we're going to catch them but quite fresh hippopotamus tracks and now we've just got a herd of impala that is standing in this early morning dawn with their fur raised up and you can see this young male here let's see if we can get a little bit closer to him and I'll show you what I mean by fur raised up 
You'll notice that they're quite fuzzy at this time of the day. There we go. No, no, don't go anywhere. Why are you doing that? So let's see if we can reverse a little bit. There you can see where they get their characteristic local Afrikaans name of red buck from is that red basically stripe across their back or that red mantle that they have. And that's their undercoat that's shining through like that. Just like we do when we cold our hair, each hair that we have is on an erectile muscle. And when we cold, our bodies contract that muscle and raise the hair up. And what that effectively does is it slows air movement down across the body, trapping a layer of air that is then warmed by your body between the hairs, keeping you a little bit warmer. The next step would be to start shivering. That's an involuntary muscular action to generate some heat in your muscles. And then basically what your body does is starts to shut down extremities. <laughs> basically starts to get blood coming from all your toes and your fingers and your nose and your ears. And starts to force it into your core. We don't get that cold in South Africa. There are very, very few places in South Africa that you could get hypothermia or frostbite. Actually, I lie. There are a few places that are in South Africa where you could do that. But uh, from, from, our, from our surface area, we're actually semi-arid, very warm. It's much more likely in South Africa to get dehydration and heat exhaustion than it is to get hypothermia and frostbite. Is this Impala going again? Not looking too nervous, I'll be honest with you. Although he seems to be quite frantic, that's not anything but he just felt like he was a little bit alone. Impala don't like to be alone for too long. Let's go forward a little bit and have a look at this male, whatever he's up to, and see the herd that he's just joined now. So yeah, you'll see that as the, as the day starts warming up, just in a little bit of time, the reddish color, that brilliant red that you saw, will disappear underneath a more tanny coat as the hair starts to lay flat again. Now this is a mixed herd of impala. There's some females and some males. And that hasn't been the case for the last couple of months. For those who watch the show quite often, you would have noticed that uh, in May we had the rut and their male impala were separate. You had a dominant ram and he was with the females and then the rest of the impala, all the young males were grouped together in these bachelor herds. Now they've all joined forces again and that's because from the rut, which happened in the beginning of May this year, uh, basically there's been a decrease in testosterone levels in these impala and now they're not as aggressive anymore and so they're tolerating um, these herds forming out of both males and females again. And that's a good thing. More eyes and more ears mean that there's a greater chance of seeing a predator. And so that's just Mother Nature's way. She, she, she has these dips and troughs in testosterone with these males. And when it's not needed for the two herds to be separated, the males from the females, then they join forces together and look after the newly pregnant females and they will be pregnant for about, I think, gee whiz, it's like level one guiding over here coming back to me again with uh, trying to guess exactly how long impalas are pregnant for, but it's 220 days. So they'll be pregnant for 220 days and we can expect the first lambs to be dropped here at the end of October, somewhere around November with the majority of them again in December. Joey, all the way from Australia, I suppose it's a good afternoon to you in uh, that part of the world. And um, you've asked how close I can get to Impala in a vehicle. Joey, you can get so close to them that they will basically be brushing the sides of the car. Not this particular herd, but herds that are, are associated with camps. Quite often these camps and lodges in this particular area have these open areas that are around the camp um, that are denuded of trees and it's to give guests in the camp a nice view over the plains so to say and um, quite often impalas frequent these plains and those impalas become very relaxed with people and with cars and uh, we find often 
that uh, those impala literally you could walk between them not quite touch them but they get so used to people and cars that right right up to the vehicles right up to you even on foot let's get into a nice place to see if we can watch the sunrise now the conundrum that I'm facing at the moment is do I follow up on those what to me look like old lion tracks at Treehouse Dam or do we carry on going for our adventure at Cheetah Plains now, the choices that I'm faced with on a morning like this do we follow lion or do we go on an adventure <laughs> Kirsten says she votes Cheetah Plains only because we don't know what's going on there as well right, let's find a nice place here through the trees where we can watch the sun come up and that'll give us a chance to switch the car off and listen to the bush around us which is very important it's actually how I find most of the animals that I uh, that I show you is through my ears or ear in this case because my one ear is otherwise occupied with final control let's have a look down there and so are we enjoying this sunrise together and I'm busy wobbling on at anything that comes to mind I'm also busy listening for alarm calls. There's a sinking mass of air that, have, that has gradually been coming down and cooling down and, and therefore sinking throughout the evening. And what this does is this creates this very stable column of air just close to the Earth's surface. And this animals and birds have used for centuries to talk to one another over large distances. So it's a good time to hear for roaring, both leopard and lion roar. And it's also a very good time to hear the alarm calls of animals. Are you looking through the tangled mass of a marula tree in the foreground? And the horizon, which is actually quite far, it's probably about a mile or two away. Right to the east. Now we've just had our winter solstice on the 21st of June. It was the longest night of... Uh, of our winter or our dry season I must say it's been very pleasant to be sleeping where we are in these cooler temperatures and with these long nights most of us sit around the fire at night time not knowing what to do with ourselves before we go to bed but it has been a lovely balance to the chaos nature that is summer and we all feel it people animals and in an in anticipation of the season to come everything's taking these last few weeks of the dry season to uh, to just rest and relax well, we are probably going to have to move for this car that's in front of us and while we do so I think it would be a good time to send you over to Jamie who's got an update for you while Steph moves out of the way of another vehicle we have I think found Karula's cubs track not Karula's tracks just her cubs but they're fresh enough that I think they've disappeared off towards one of her favorite areas which is Treehouse Dam now let's keep our eyes peeled because I think with full bellies she'll have moved her cubs away from the kill site so that they don't attract the attention of any marauding hyenas but at the same time, with full bellies, I don't think she's going to have moved them too far away. Let's just do a quick loop around. I'm so excited to see them again. I may be too excited. I always feel like Murphy's Law is going to deny me the chance to see them. Just because I really want to see how big they've grown. I've seen the screenshots, of course, and they are looking compared to when we first saw them absolutely enormous but still incredibly cute very fluffy and there's not much that is cuter than a leopard cub I know James says that lion cubs are the cutest um what do you think Brian lion or leopard I'm on the fence. you're on the fence okay fair enough depends on what we're seeing on the day that's true that is true. Lion, yeah, that is true. Lion cubs are that constant sort of ow, ow sound that they call to each other and to their mothers is also incredibly appealing. I don't know. Okay, we'll we'll reserve judgment for now and we'll find. Let's find both today. <laughs> Let's do both. Let's 
go shoot high, aim high. All right, now these tracks have gone completely off the road. Now while we investigate and see if we can't concentrate on tracking down Karula and her cubs, let's find out what Mr. Hendry has planned. Good afternoon, no, good morning everybody, that's the second time in a row I've managed to make a mess like that. Good morning and welcome to the bushwalk. It's marvellous to be on foot again. My name is James Hendry, Viam is on camera, hello Viam. That's Viam's really lengthy thumb, for some it's about the same length as his bottom leg. Now, uh, also with us today, Herbert, who is on security detail, he'll be wandering about here tracking things and finding the, uh, especially finding the things of the bush that are relevant to the Shangan culture of this area and I think that's quite an important thing for us to be looking at. Right, it's 11 degrees Celsius apparently, it feels a little warmer than that, it's, uh, but it's windy, there's a strong northwesterly breeze coming from behind me and we're going to just sort of invest, I'm not sure what we're going to do today, that's the joy of walking out here. We're going to see about the small things and if we can help Jamie with tracking those little cubbies then that's what we'll do. She's basically down there where I'm pointing now with my rather impressive stick and we're going to get walk that way and see if we don't intersect with the tracks. And by that way I mean we're going to move that way. Right, on we, on we go. Now, of course, being on foot is a vastly different experience from being in the vehicle, and it is indeed very pleasant to be walking again, to be in touch, as it were, with nature in far sort of closer contact. Now, let us first take a look at this rather large tree. It's called a gardenia, it's called a Transvaal gardenia, or I think, I think that's what they call it, Gardenia falkensia anyway, that's the, that's the botanical name. And it has the most delightful smelling flower of all the flowers out here. It smells like sweet jasmine, but only for two or three days of the year. But it is one of the last remaining trees to have leaves on it. And what's interesting, if you look around here, That's VMP being uh, artistic this morning. If you look around here, you'll see that all the lower leaves have been browsed off. See that? They've all been browsed off. And clearly the top part of the tree has hardly been touched. Now that means that the giraffe and the elephants are not particularly partial to this and it'll be interesting to see as the season progresses whether they become interested or not. I would also suggest that it isn't even the impala that are eating these. This looks to me like it's been fed on by a diker and something very small. I mean, yeah, an, an impala will eat, it could be impala as well. They reach up to round about this height. It's quite an interesting browse line. Here, everywhere you stop, you see, you find hundreds of different things, is the burrow, I think. I would say that's a bushveld gerbil, or it's an excavation by a bushveld gerbil. And you know what they found here, VMP? Whatever it was that excavated this, quite possibly a bushveld gerbil, they found themselves a dung beetle ball. Now inside this dung beetle ball there would have been an egg and or the and the egg may well have hatched already and the grub then would have been feeding on the dung. In fact I think this is probably the dung inside here. And out of it, once it's pupated when the next rains come, will emerge a very new dung beetle. Vyam's just getting himself himself caught on top there. Yeah, I can't see anything in here. Let me try and break it with my stick. It was very successful. Did you see that, Vim? No, I was getting out of the tree. <laughs> he says he's getting out of the tree. Yeah, anyway, this is still intact. Oh, you know, this is a marula. This is a marula seed. It is unrelated to this. So that's what would have happened here. There's also evidence of. In fact, so maybe this isn't a. This might not be a bushveld gerbil. There's evidence here of millipedes. Now, millipedes we know are eaten extensively by burrowing scorpions and the burrowing scorpion well this will be a very substantial burrowing scorpion if this is where he lives but that is perhaps what he is he can cope with the cyanide in the millipede's body somehow I don't know how 
And so maybe that's what it is, rather than a bushveld gerbil, which would be rather more, I suppose, a seed eater than it would a grub and uh, millipede eater. Very nice. Right. There's the sun over there. Do you see it, Viam? It's that big yellow thing over there. And also sitting, gazing into the golden rays and warming his face, Mr. Stefan Winterboer. <laughs> I'm actually warming my face, James. Isn't actually quite far wrong from that. Only thing is... <clears throat> is I can't even stare at the sun anymore. You're looking at the sun there through a filter or two. And because we've had such a windless days the last couple of days, we actually have got no dust in the atmosphere. And it's actually almost too bright to have a look at, which is actually phenomenal. But one thing about this sun of ours, you know, it is our closest star. It is about 8.3 light minutes away. Whereas the next closest star is 4.3 light years away and that is a vast vast difference so we 8.3 light minutes away from our sun and i've just read the most interesting fact that the escape velocity which means a particle of matter would need to be traveling at this particular speed to escape the gravity of our sun needs to be traveling at 620 kilometers per second to escape the gravity of our sun. Now that pretty means, let's turn that into miles for you, it's divided by 1.6 and my mathematics is not that good. So you can take 620 and divide it by 1.6 would be the miles per second that a particle of matter needs to basically be traveling at to escape the sun. Now although that doesn't interest many people, for me that is quite an interesting thing and we haven't even got a very big sun our sun isn't particularly hot it isn't particularly big it doesn't have any unique features apart from the fact that it seems to be the only planet that we or the only star that we know of that has a planet with liquid water on it and bearing life in all its profusion so it is a unique star in that sense it's going to be a hot day today which is good we're moving fast towards our spring, which happens on the 1st of September. And uh, after spring, around about November, we're going to have our summer. And we're expecting here the knob thorns to start flowering here somewhere around about the 10th to the 20th of August. We'll start getting the first flowers in the bush. But on that note, and while we cross this little drainage line in front of us with signal breakups, Jamie has got an update for you. I do indeed have an update for you and I, the, the update comes right as Steph sent you back across onto Wendy, which is of course our trusty vehicle that is creaking a little bit like she has some serious wheel pain. There we go. So that's what we are, that's exactly what we've been looking for right next to Treehouse Dam, exactly where we expected to find them. And let me just hop out because I want to investigate and see whether or not she has her cubs with her or if it's just Karula, the female leopard that we've been searching for. Oh, an answer is almost apparent. Let me just see. Can you see these ones, Brian? Over here. Cool, thank you. So here's Karula's tracks over here. This is her front foot with its four toes. And here's her back foot, slightly narrower, slightly longer. What we're looking for at this point is little miniature leopard tracks as well, which I don't see at the moment. I've got civet tracks wandering about. Oh, yeah, there they are. I think the way that I've put Brian is going to make life very difficult, but there are little tiny leopard feet walking up along with her. And in fact, now that I look more carefully, it tells a whole story here because they've been crisscrossing around mom. You've seen the way that the leopard cubs move, the way that they follow their mother, they dash to one side and then they come back and they kind of sort of zigzag around her legs and that's what they've been doing. They've been crisscrossing. Okay, and generally when they follow this route and these tracks are not fresh fresh. The wind's been blowing all night and their outline, if you compare it to which ones were we looking at? These ones. Compare the outline of those tracks 
to, can you see that track there, Brian, that I've made? Thank you. Compare that to the crispness of my shoe print. Now, we know I've just made that. These tracks are not fresh, but the wind is blowing, which always ages tracks a lot quicker than they might otherwise. Okay, let's go see if she's still on the property. Usually when she follows this road, I dread to say, means she's going south towards Little Gauri. But let's just check. So Little Gauri is south of our traverse area, away from where we can follow up on her. But that's okay. If she's left our boundary for now, we can always look forward to her return and we can go look for the hyena den. A lovely question from Michael, because of course if these tracks don't cross out, let's say they go into this block, then we'll have to go wandering about on foot to see whether or not we can find them. Now Michael's raised an interesting point, which is how will the cubs react to us on foot? Would they run away or would they watch Karula's reaction in order to gauge how they should react? Michael, it's a, it's a really interesting one. Ooh, tiny little feet walking along Treehouse Road. Yes, the animals, the baby animals will react and watch the way that their mothers respond to something. They take their cues from the mother itself. However, seeing people on foot, I, don't, I think the cubs are slowly getting used to. They've been tracked multiple times on foot before, whether it's by us or by other guides further off to the south. So they'll be getting used to it. I think they'll still run away a little bit. Sorry, sorry, Michael. I'll get back to you in a second. I'm just having a look at how crisp these tracks are. Oh, this is such a lovely example. I'm going to try to show you because we get a chance to see how big these feet are as well. And I can show you what I mean about the cubs crisscrossing around her. Oh, this is so cute. Okay. Sorry, Michael. Be back responding to you in one second. But just have a look here. You've got these little stream of baby tracks racing back towards where mom has walked through. There you can see where they collided with mom. Backwards and forwards. Little cub prints absolutely everywhere. Okay, please little cub is still be here. You can almost imagine, you can picture the scene that happened here. There's just leopard tracks everywhere. Bouncing backwards and forwards and of course they're at that age now where they're much more playful. A little bit braver, a little bit more confident in their abilities. Okay. Let's go and follow up, see if we can't. I almost, it's this funny thing, and I'm not the only guide that's ever felt this, but when you see tracks like this, you actually really don't want to drive over them. There's something so perfect about the evidence that an animal's left behind. It's almost like tearing up a newspaper with the day's news. It's a bizarre thought, I know, it's completely irrational, but it's just the way I feel. I hate driving over them. I, I like leaving them for somebody else to see as well, because they tell you such a beautiful story. Okay, we'll duck around them. Uh, just close my eyes and drive. No, don't close your eyes, you're looking for leopards. Uh, Michael, they will, I think they'll run away a little bit. And they'll watch the way that Karula reacts and it'll get to the point where they will be like Sindile was. So Sindile, when he was Shadow's cub, when he was sort of seven, eight months old, when I first started working at Wild Earth, he was, it was incredible. He was so beautifully react relaxed on foot, even more so actually than his mum. His shadow had a tendency, she hasn't done it for a long time, to me at least, but that's because I haven't seen her in a while, but shadow had a tendency when you walked up to her to go Burr! Something I think Brian experienced at one point, yeah. She'd come charging out with stiff legs and bristling fur, but Sindile on the other hand was absolutely magical. He was so relaxed, you could sit 20 meters, not that we did often, but you could sit 20 meters from him and just enjoy his company. And I think Karula's cubs will get to that point. And while we investigate, I think the wondrous and terribly entertaining James has found himself on a very popular spot at Wild Earth. 
Hello everybody, we're here at the Fireside Chat and James Richard, you reminded me and well done for remembering that. We're here at the Buffalo Skull uh, that we had in our tent and in it of course we found two gecko eggs. Now in the interim, while we've been away, the eggs are still there but you can only just sort of see them. So Viem will now stick his, uh, stick his ca camera up the cavity here and you'll be able to see where the egg is. So is my hand in the way. There we are. Yeah, you will be able to see it, I promise everybody. There, oh dear, Viem. What's going on there? You practiced this five or six times. There you go. Okay, now that white bit there is the egg. White bit just to the left of that sort of a ridge of bone, there's an egg there. So there is at least one gecko egg left inside the cranium of this buffalo. Which I think is rather splendid. It looks a bit muddy in there because a whole lot of the termite mound that had been built up the side of the tree that I left this against seems to have fallen down into the skull. So that should provide a little bit of a sort of covering, I suppose, for the little gecko eggs. We don't know when or if they're going to hatch. Uh, they may or may not hatch. Um, I think it's quite an odd time for a gecko to have laid her eggs in the middle of winter. Normally, apparently, it's in the summertime. And quite interestingly for a reptile, they only, um, they only lay two eggs or so, which is, is not many eggs at all. All right, let's go this way. We're going to head down vaguely into the area where Jamie is with those tracks. I, we, both, we all think that she's probably crossed south, but let's go down there. We'll see if we can give her a hand. In the meantime, I'm sure there'll be lots of other things for us to look at. Over in the distance, we can hear a whole lot of elephants shouting. And while we are just seeing if we, I don't think we're going to see them, they're quite a long way west of where we are now. Mike in Florida, you want me to try and find you a scorpion or an arachnid. Now, I'm not the eyes of Steph, but I will certainly do my best to find you a scorpion or another kind of arachnid. Very few and far between are the spiders and things at this stage. Right, let's carry on here. The elephants are all shouting off towards the west. I've lost my stick. <laughs> I knew I'd lose it. I think I've probably dropped it by the fireside. I'm just looking. Herbert's gone very kindly gone to fetch it for me. Thank you, Herbert. In common go for Baba Herbert. Gary, you want to know why I need a stick? Well, I need a stick for two reasons. The first is to bash Viam on the head when he's uh, not behaving himself. The second is to, when a, when a buffalo charges, what you do is, as you could time it just right, you take a swing like that, and if you clock it just behind the top of the head, you stun it, and it sits down, and then it doesn't kill you. That's why I need a stick. That is, of course, utter nonsense. I carry a stick purely after... You know what? There are two reasons I carry the stick. First is because I quite enjoy pointing at things with it. The second is that um, the last time I didn't have a stick, I was shown a clip of myself uh, pointing out some stuff on a termite mound, and my left hand uh, sat at this very strange angle. Um, and I was described as a sort of Tyrannosaurus rex, an effeminate or velociraptor. And uh, so I decided that I would from henceforth always carry a stick when I was on foot. Right. I'm not sure if you've been introduced to Herbert properly this morning. This is Herbert. Herbert lives very close by. Uh, he is a superb tracker. He's a superb guide. And uh, he is basically on security detail helping us to just spot things. Because, you know, when we're on foot like this, it is very important that we keep very aware of what's going on around us. And while certainly for we've done many, many walks with just the cameraman and the presenter, it's much safer now because I can just concentrate on the lens and VM can concentrate on filming and that sort of thing. And we know that Herbert's got his eyes out in the bush uh, looking all the time for anything, uh, well, that might be entertaining or that could be a potential threat. So that is the plan from here. <laughs> Come 
Kyle, um, I'm going to assume that your question is uh, slightly facetious. You're saying, are there, do I have any plans to climb a tree? Um, Kyle, I don't, but uh, if I find a candidate for tree climbing, yes, I will certainly climb it. Um, I do need to sort of redeem myself after my last attempt, which resulted in a slightly odd uh, fall from the top of a tree. Uh, I didn't fall onto the ground, I therefore do not say that I fell out of the tree, but more sort of within the tree. So I might try and climb a tree. We'll see if we can find a good candidate. I did find one yesterday while we were on drive. It was a marula tree that had a whole lot of moisture sort of in the branches, which was very strange indeed. Not sure why it was like that or where that moisture came from. Now one of the nice things about the winter, if you look down through there, we can see through the bush and those elephants are wandering about somewhere over there. And in summertime, of course, that would be far, far too thick for us to be able to see anything. So it's quite nice in winter time to be able to see a little bit better. Right, let's head across to Jamie, get an update from her while Steph heads towards Cheetah Plains, and hopefully we'll have something interesting the next time we see you. As we cruise along incredibly slowly, checking the southern boundary, my update is to tell you something that happened behind the scenes. Obviously, I've been on leave, and um, I missed out on all of the shenanigans that were occurring, but thanks to our loyal viewers, I did get to watch the video of James falling out of the tree. I mentioned it casually in conversation last night, to which he replied, I'll have you know I didn't fall out of the tree. What happened? The branch snapped and I controlled my descent most gracefully. It wasn't graceful at all. There was nothing graceful about it. <laughs> the branch snapped. I can only imagine how his shoulder must have felt after that because it took the full brunt of his weight. Oof. It must have pulled terribly. <laughs> but it was hilarious to watch. So thank you for those of you who put up the video. Between Brent and James falling out of trees, and they've given us a very clear indication that perhaps as a species we are no, long, we no longer have the climbing skills that our ancestors used to have. On a completely different tack, I believe that Mr. Winterboer has been exploring Cheetah Plains, reacquainting himself. Let's go and see what feathered creature he's found. Yes, and we are at Cheetah Plains and we've just got one of my most favorite birds, the Glossy Starling, the Greater Blue-Eared Glossy Starling. Getting its name from that cheek pad that you see just below its ear. Now, it's quite difficult for us to, they're quite fast-moving birds, but just have a look at those colors, that brilliantly orange eye. There we go, standing in the sun for a second to try and get you. Let's see if I can move my car slightly. There you go, an insectivorous bird, so running around on the ground looking for titbits, insects, ants and termites basically. Let's see if we can go backwards a little bit. All right. Just all of David's skill at, uh, no. Nevertheless, there will be others. We are finally in Cheetah Plains, and uh, what I can say is that we are surrounded by a bird party. That wasn't just the glossy stuff. Oh, did we blow that one? All right. <laughs> Fast moving birds. All right. <laughs> And from the birds that eat worms to the actual worm, James has found some. It is indeed some kind of a worm. Look over here. <clears throat> and uh, worm, of course, is, a, is not actually a biological term. This sort of worm is actually an insect grub. And it's, I don't know what it is, but you can see its digestive system. You can see that black bit going down through the middle of it. It's quite interesting. And Herbert says it's called Bongo in Shangan. 
and apparently they're very delicious to eat. Uh, Viam and I have declined the offer to eat them, and when I suggested to, um, to Herbert that he might like to eat it, he um, recoiled in horror and ran away. So I think it's probably a more desperation diet than a delicacy. I don't know what kind of grub it is, so it's a larva. If you look carefully, I know that's a bit nasty of me to turn him over, but you can see maybe that he's only got six legs. So he's definitely an insect, and that means he will probably become a beetle of some kind. He could easily become a ground beetle. I'm going to suggest that that's probably what he is. Look at him burrowing under the ground there. Then there was a centipede here as well, but he seems to have escaped. Now he's going to be buried completely. We'll let him bury himself. While we do that, a whole lot of termites here as well. And there's a big soldier. And these termites belong to a mound that Viam is just sitting behind. And they've come out of the mound and they're foraging and eating away at this piece of marula tree that's fallen out of its... Well, it's fallen out of the tree, unsurprisingly, or been pulled down by elephants. And it's now being eaten by the termites. And they've even left a little cask over here that I'm going to open up. There we are. And they've, they, I mean, so they've half sort of built a mound under the ground as well. And there we have the digging. Look, he's almost buried himself completely there. Isn't that amazing? I think that's so very clever. Don't know what he eats. Don't know what species of beetle he is, but probably a ground beetle, perhaps. Let's just have a look over here. What is this? This looks like a fungus, everyone. There are lots and lots of different kinds of fungi that grow all over the wood here. And interestingly, I mean, everything here is, is, is dry, you know, so there's not much moisture. And yet still, fungus, which we know likes moist environments, manages to thrive here. Okay. Oof, those elephants are very angry there. Shouting. You can't hear them. They're going... Vian, would you like to do an impression? There we go. That's exactly what they sound like. I'm going to flip this back over. Just simply because it's much... You know, we've disturbed what isn't essentially a miniature ecosystem here. And then... A question from Croach Renee. You want to know how big the termites are? The termites there, the big soldier termite, is about half an inch. So he's about half an inch long. And the little ones, no more than sort of three or four millimeters long, which is very small. Right, let's wander off down this way. We're still looking for spider and scorpion. <coughs> And we might be lucky. Of course, all the crab spiders that are specially designed to live on the flowers out here are pretty much dead for the season. They'll have laid their eggs and the little egg sacs will be hanging in various plants waiting for better climate for them. Okay, let's go and find out from Jamie how her karula hunting is going. We'll continue down here. Well, we have really good news, I hope. And the really good news is that in our, during our Karula search, rather, we, um, I think I've established that she hasn't crossed to the south of us, at least from where her tracks were last seen. Which is really good news because chances are that means she's still somewhere here on Juma. All that means though is that we just have to now figure out exactly where she is and where she's hidden those little babies of hers. Which might mean going for a little bit of a stroll. I just want to check this one. This is the last place I want to check, which is along this road, Shabam Road. And interestingly enough, Shabam, spelt with an X, in the local languages, the X sound is a sh sound. Now this is Shabam Road, and she loves it. Treehouse Road, Shabam Road, Philemon's Cutline, all sort of favorite paths of Karula. So I want to check that she hasn't popped out here. If she hasn't popped out here, then it's sort of safe to assume that she's in the block there somewhere with those cubs. Exciting times. The bush is actually now getting harder and harder to spot leopards in. 
Now, speaking about tracking on foot and searching for leopards in this brown bush and so perfectly geared towards the camouflage, a warm welcome to Lynn and good morning. Welcome to the Sunrise Safari. You wanted to know what would be the most protective towards their babies. And the answer very much is a lion. A lioness that is looking after young ones, and I've, I've done it once, maybe, tw I'm trying to think about, I've done it twice, where I've stumbled in upon lionesses with very young cubs totally accidentally. And where I used to work, there were very thick, dense river systems, beautiful, but also quite scary to walk in. And there is nothing like a protective lioness. And a leopard's a bit smaller. She, a leopardess is used to having to run away from things. A lioness stands her ground more so than any other lion encounters. She gives a, a, a low growl that speaks to one of our most sort of basic and atavistic instincts within us. It's a very scary sound. And she's usually very determined in telling you to go away. And it, quite often with sort of brief but very fast rushes forward with her teeth bared and making a sound that sounds roughly like a motorbike. Though without, without question a lioness is one of the most protective or definitely the most protective of her cubs. Hyenas will run away, the hyena cubs will run to their den, that's why they have those den sites. And leopards generally, they might charge you depending on how close you've got to them and it's important again to know the leopard and to never underestimate them because I've said the chances are they'll move away from you. Karula, from what I've experienced and what, from what other guides have experienced, she's actually wonderful on foot. She's beautifully relaxed even when the cubs have been quite small and they've been stumbled upon by mistake. She's always taken it in her stride as only the Queen of Juma can because at 12 years old she's seen it all. She's learned all about what people on foot means and doesn't bother her in the slightest. I'm not sure I would feel quite so comfortable <coughs> going to look for the Nkuhuma lioness, for example, with brand new cubs. All right, she hasn't popped out here either, which is good news. It means we've narrowed down pretty much exactly where she might be. So I'm going to head back to the last tracks that I saw. I'm going to go for a quick walk while I do that. Let's find out how Steph's explorations of Cheetah Plains is going. And it's lucky that you just come back to us in actual fact, because we are about to approach three in a row pan, which I'm hoping has been pumped. Um, it's not a naturally occurring pan. It is in a bit of a drainage line sort of depression, so it, it tends to lose water quite quickly, I think either from the gradient or actually just from the porous nature of the pan. But what is going to be nice is seeing what's there. This time of the day, these water sources generally are not good to see animals, but they are a fantastic place, a node, so to say, to have a look for whatever's been passing through in the night. Quite often, leopard and lion frequent pans in the dark, as no doubt you would have seen from time to time on the dam cam. And Scott has just asked me if I've ever seen a pangolin. I have, Scott. I've been privileged enough to see quite a few. I can't remember offhand exactly how many I've seen. Probably about five or six pangolin in my life. Um, with the first one being here in the Sabi Sands. It's one of the greatest, uh, it's one of the areas of great, that, that, that you have great luck in seeing pangolins is the Sabi Sands. And all due to a study that was done by a scientist called Jonathan Swart, who for years used to track and follow pangolin. Ah, we've got some water here. And he had a couple of pangolin that he used to be able to radio collar and you could join him on these walks and, uh, and see these pangolin. Right, so as I, as I suspected, we haven't got a great profusion of life around the water here, but it will allow us to actually view the tracks in the sand around the pans. As I was saying, the dam cams that you have access to quite often we get these updates from you which are most welcome by the way uh, to uh, to tell us that there's been lion or leopard at some odd hour in the evening these water points this is one of the very few 
points of water that we have here on the Kruger National Park boundary. A couple of years ago, the Kruger Park decided that it would be a good idea to close down all of their watering points and just leave natural water sources in the Kruger. Now, I can't remember the total, but it was up in the, in the mid hundreds of pans that they closed. And what that led to, basically, in the dry, dry times, was animals being pulled out of the Kruger into the Sabi sands. And this was one of the pans that would pull a lot of animals. A mini buffalo. Looks like an enormous herd of buffalo. Came to the pan yesterday at some point. We have another bird party here. And have a look. No, my luck with birds today is not the greatest of things, I must be honest with you. None of them want to sit still long enough for us to have a view of them. Alrighty. So we do a circle and see if we can find out where this massive herd of buffalo have ended up. James, I'm sure, is dying to tell you what he's got under his fingers at the moment. From the tree of life to the skin of death. There, everybody, is the remains of a Karula kill many, many uh, moons ago that was stolen by hyenas and dragged up here. It was an impala. It is no longer an impala. Of course it is uh, dead. You can see that, of course, by its lifeless body. And it's just actually a piece of old leathery skin, which probably would have been quite nice to make a purse out of, don't you think, Vian? Do you like to make a purse out of this leather, or do you think it's too far gone? I don't use purses. Uh, VM says he doesn't use a purse. Anyway, it's really hard. Watch this. So that is how hard hide goes, and that is important mainly because, of course, that's how local people used to make their shields, out of car hide or buffalo hide, and if you cure it in the sun for long enough, it goes hard like that, and while it most certainly did, failed inescapably to stop bullets, it certainly was very effective against throwing spears. So, and also, um, I've had another thought that overtook the one that I was having already. Um, so very good for stopping spears, and the spears in this area generally were thrown fairly ineffectively, so that was pretty good for that. And also very good for drum making, that was the second thought that I had. Now, over here we have a mysterious piece of dung. Now, I am not clear as to what this is. Initially, I thought bird, but I actually think it's a snake. I think a snake has come along here and relieved itself. Now, the reason I can tell it's bird or snake, of course, is because it does have the white on it. Now, that white is uric acid. Uh, because, remember, they've only got one opening, one cloacal opening, so the feces and the urine come out of the same hole at the same time. And that white stuff on top is the uric acid that comes uh, along in the urine, which in, in, you know, in humans' case or in mammals' cases gets expelled differently through the kidneys. This comes out through the cloaca with the feces. So I'm going to say that this is a snake that has come crawling along here at some stage, uh, avoided its bowels, uh, probably much relieved, and walked off, oh, didn't walk at all, did it? It slunk off, probably to sit in a termite mound for the duration of this chilly winter's day. It's not fresh at all. Right, let us carry on down here. Herbert has wandered off at some speed in this direction. Kathy, you want me to know? You want to know if I'm going to show you any bush survival tricks? Um, Kathy, I, I'm not a great bush survivor. Uh, I'd love to tell you that I am, but I, that really is Steph's kind of speciality. Um, I could certainly make an attempt to show you a few, and you want to know what Herbert also thought of Steph's attempts at drinking fresh elephant dung. I think Herbert was scandalized to the point of wanting to find another job, to be honest. No, that's not true. But Herbert certainly suggested it, and then her, um, I remember Steph saying, oh, asking him if he'd ever done it before, and Herbert said, no, of course he hadn't. He drinks water at home. This thing smells horrible. It's an impala head. But it's quite not. Oh, it really is <coughs> quite violently sm stinky, isn't it, Viam? Oh, it smells like an old hide. Yeah, well, I don't know. Maybe I'm sitting the wrong side of the wind. But it's quite nicely intact. So let's flip it over here and look at the difference 
or well, it's not actually so much of a difference it looks exactly like a miniature buffalo when you look at the bottom there like that and those are the herbivorous teeth of a ruminant so they chew and they chew and they chew three times or what, twice over the food that they eat and you can just see the little brain case inside and I was reading quite interestingly today you know the size of the brain so an impala obviously has a much smaller brain than a buffalo's but it doesn't necessarily make it uh, less intelligent than a buffalo is it's appropriate for its size <whistles> oh, <it's laughs> I, thought, I thought Herbert was calling us but he was sneezing <laughs> Ugh. That is amazing. Jen B, you want to know that hardened hide would be good enough for shoes um, or shoe bottoms? Yeah, I think it would. I think it would be very effective for it. I think it's probably too far gone now. I'm not sure that you could resuscitate it sufficiently to work it into shoes. But uh, were I a cobbler, I'm sure that impala skin, probably buffalo skin better, but impala skin could be used for soft shoes, perhaps, perhaps for slippers. All right, I think that's all I can tell you about this. Sorry, Dina, I missed your question. We're going to have to have that again. Oh, where's the organ of Jacobson? How very nicely asked, Dina. Unfortunately, it's been removed. The organ of Jacobson, everybody, is that vemoronasal organ. And there's a there are two little holes here in the front of the herbivore, or most, most mammals, palates that's the palate there if you turn it over here it's on the nasal bone here it's probably that's pro it probably sat on that ridge of bone somewhere there it would have been a tiny little organ that then sends uh, indications into this not substantial brain uh, and that of course helps the animal interpret signs of or pheromone signs so you've all seen those animals do the phlegm and grimace or many of you would have you've certainly seen horses doing it where they lift the top lip cats do it as well these guys do it to a certain extent and uh, they've all got what's called the vemoronasal organ which interprets pheromones especially in urine and I don't know if you saw that there was a flesh-eating worm which also would have been a larvae probably of a flesh-eating beetle that just crawled into that little socket there and that socket would have had a nerve coming out of it at one stage of this impala's life before it was undoubtedly killed by something uh, like a leopard I think probably a leopard killed us and it's been sort of untouched by hyenas because I, I think if a hyena had taken this they would have eaten the entire skull ad, as would lions but leopards would have stopped at uh, the soft bony bits above the nose Right, now, if you are a younger viewer watching, please remember that if you do touch things in the wilderness, and it's, I, ideally you've got to be very careful about what you touch. Plants, generally no problem. Dung, you've got to be a little bit more careful of. Rotting flesh and bones, you must be particularly careful of. And if you do ever touch anything in the bush, please make sure that you wash your hands before you touch your face or your mouth. And that's something I still have to remind myself to do constantly. Right, we're just heading down in a sort of southerly direction on a game path and you can see this is a natural place a natural place where animals would walk now Jamie and Steph are tracking so with any luck they'll be lucky that's probably not the best English in the world with any luck they'll be lucky come over here and let's have a look at this tree this is a red thorn tree I've always liked the, the, the name of the red thorn, red thorn, not sure why, and it is an extremely important source of forage. And as Brian was pointing out to me the other day, he said to me, why is it that these acacias have still got perfectly green leaves when everything else seems to be starting to lose their leaves? And I had to say to him, Brian, I've got absolutely no idea at all. I didn't say it like that. But what is interesting is that these acacias have got a hugely uh, high tannin load, a lot of them. So we'll taste one. Viam, would you like to taste one? Yuck. Viam says, yuck. I'm going to give him some anyway. Mm. <laughs> is it horrible? Mm. He says it's horrible. It actually doesn't taste as tanniny as I thought it was going to taste. 
but there will be some other chemical compound in this plant that makes it unpalatable. And it's only now, as we get late into the dry season, or not, we're actually just into the middle of the dry season, that this tree is becoming an important source of forage. Now, it's obviously been pushed over many, many times by elephants. The main trunk, most, most recently over here, and it is still alive. I just think that is quite remarkable that this thing is still perfectly alive. And just quickly, you can see why it's called a red thorn. You can see there, look at the underbark there. It's a lovely, rich, rusty red colour. Isn't that nice? Acacia gerardii. Oh, I put you at a horrible angle here, then. There we are. Lovely, rusty, rich red. Okay. Let's go across the Cheetah Plains, where Stier van Winterboer is investigating the pleasures of the great open areas there, and we'll catch up with you further to the south. Indeed, I took a walk around that pan, that three in a row pan that you were with us a little bit, and truth be told, there was a pride of lion that came and drank there last night. It looked like two females and a male. I'm not quite sure which lions they are, but they ended up following these buffalo that we are following. Tracks look like they are from early last night, so nothing too fresh from this morning. But what it now gives us the opportunity to do is make these circles in the direction of the track. So the tracks are heading in a northerly direction at the moment, and this particular road that we're on bends north now. I want to see if they've either crossed north into Nkoro, or if they've managed to follow these buffalo back towards the Kruger National Park side. Either way, we'll know in a few minutes where these lions have been. The lions in this particular area walk relatively far. They don't walk as far as Kalahari or desert lions do. Um, you're looking anywhere from between, uh, it's probably an average of about five miles or so that these lions enjoy walking. Male lions can, of course, sometimes patrol much further away than that. But in this particular area, we've seen that they tend to catch something and move some not too far. So mids all the way in Melbourne. Ah, let me show you here if I can. It's not the greatest of not the greatest of tracks, but it nevertheless is a lion track. Let's see if I can find you one to have a look at. Mitz, I'll get back to your question right now. If you wouldn't mind just holding on a minute or two while I show everyone that we haven't got a fictitious lion here. So, Dave, let me show you what I'm talking about here quickly. Inside the middle of that circle is a lion track and basically what I'm seeing is the back of the pad here, one, two, three lobes and the toes, one, two, three, four toes. What's confusing the whole idea is this impala track that is stepped right on the middle of that lion track. This impala track right on the middle which tells me that it's not too fresh yesterday at some point. But there are lions in the area and that is exactly the main thing. Now it's back to your question about uh, do lions and hyena digest bones? Um, they absolutely do. Hyena tend to have a little bit of a stronger digestive system than what lions do but even lion scat, when you dig through some lion scat, the majority of uh, the undigestible material that comes through is actually fur, it's, it's hair, it's not really bone. And that tells me that they're actually quite good at digesting bone. A lot of splinters come through and shards of bone in regurgitation, but very few full bones come through in feces for both hyena and for lion. All right. And on that note, and while it gives me time to scour the road in front here for some more tracks, that one of the male track there was, was too old to follow. But there are lions in this area, and hopefully we'll be able to pull them out of the grass for you. In any case, we're going to 
send you over, I think, to Jamie, and uh, we'll catch up in a bit. Look, everybody, it's a crested grasshopper or crested locust, and it was found by Herbert as he was walking through here. He flipped over this log, and under it is a young grasshopper. Now, the reason I know it's young, if you look carefully, Vim, tell me if I, you can see where my pointer is pointing. Closer. It's coming in here. Yeah. And you see that? Yes. Those are the stubs of the wings, and that means that the wings are not fully developed yet. And so this is not an adult. Once it's an adult, those wings will allow it <coughs> to fly. Well, if it's a, a male. The males, yes, the males can fly. I think the females cannot. Isn't it amazing? This is the most fantastic creature. And it's also known as a rain locust. And they make a tremendous sound in the night. And even still in winter they make that sound. Very sharp sounding, almost like a sort of winter cicada. Isn't that nice? I'm not really sure what he eats, but he's almost immobile because it's so cold. In summer, I suspect he would have hopped away. Now, he's not alone under this rock. He's got a friend that is also very cold and almost unable to move. A spider. So there's the arachnid we were searching for. And this spider, I don't know how to identify, I don't know what it is. So Mike in Florida, there's your spider. It looks to me like a baby baboon spider, um, but I don't know why it would be living under a rock as opposed to in a hole, but it's some kind of um, probably burrowing spider it's gone into the comfort of the grass there. Okay, we'll leave it there, uh, lest it bite me. I'm sure it's probably harmless, actually. So now we'll put this back, just gently see what it was, and just pop it over the top there of the grasshopper and give him a comfortable place to enjoy his winter's morning. There you are. Remain calm. Okay, on we go. Very nice, very nice. Dropped my radio. <laughs> Justin, you say, what is something I have learned in the bush that I will never forget? Justin, there are things I learn in the bush every single day that I hopefully will never forget, but that have profoundly altered the way my view of the world is. Um, Justin, I don't know so much that it's a fact or a... Um, uh, an interesting piece of wilderness knowledge. I think it's far more a sense. It's a sense of the world, it's a sense of our place as human beings in the world, and a sense of how we uh, interact with nature as the sort of apex predator. I, I almost don't like the word saying that, but I guess that's what we are, we're the apex predator. And so it's been a profound learning experience to see how animals and creatures and everything else out here reacts to us as human beings. So I suppose that's what I would take out of this if I ever had to go and do a desk job in a city somewhere. That's what I would try and remember with me, to take with me the whole time. And also, I think the other important things that I've learned out here have been, I mean, apart from all of the incredible things I've seen and the wonders of the tiny little pieces of nature you learn about, those spiders and those grasshoppers and those locusts and then all the way up to the elephants and the buffalo. It's been an interaction with people like Herbert who have altered my life profoundly um, because of course I come from the city, I come from um, a, a white South African which means I, I come from a background of tremendous privilege um, uh, that was, you know, born of the fact that I ha was born with a white skin. And coming out here and working in these areas has introduced me, of course, to the majority of, of South Africans uh, who are, for, by and large, poor and live in a very different way. And that has been 
I think possibly even more valuable to me as a human being than my time w working in the wilderness. And it's only through my time working out here that I've come across fantastic people and learned so much more about the whole of South African and indeed probably African society. So, nice question there. Probably uh, better discussed over a, a table and a, a fine Scott Mott malt whiskey. Hang on. We're going to go to Jamie. Just hold the camera steady, Vim. There's something on it that you will not believe. I just have to capture it. There it is. Look at that. <laughs> it's a little stick insect. Tiny little stick insect. And that had decided it wanted to be on TV, but it didn't realize that Vim's focal length was much too long to be able to get it where it was sitting. Isn't that nice? <laughs> yeah, it's coming back to you. <laughs> All right, let's head across to Jamie and find out how her leopard tracking is going. My leopard, my leopard tracking hit something of an obstacle. It actually hit a couple of obstacles, very large obstacles with very big horns and very grumpy tempers. And what I mean by that is I went exactly to where we had the last tracks, looked at where they went off, got out of the car, well actually I, before I got out of the car I saw one buffalo in front of me. I then got out of the car and heard ox pickers buzzing everywhere around me and the entire spot where I need to go tracking Karula and her cubs is just filled with buffalo. There were just buffalo everywhere. I got out of the car and I did a little bit of a walk and everywhere I looked there was another buffalo bull looking at me with that. They have an expression. Um, it's in part disinterest and the other part is do I actually want to get rid of you? Do I want to move you out of my way? So I took them at their word or at least their body language and I left the area. So what we'll do is we'll do a big circle, we'll go check some of the old hyena dens and then we'll come back towards the end of the sunrise safari so that the buffalo have a chance to move away from the area because they were just everywhere weren't they Brian? <laughs> no, they were just, it was impossible. I couldn't, even, I couldn't even sneak around them and they were all moving straight in the direction that the tracks were heading. And we'll have to postpone our leopard tracking for now. We'll go check some of the older hyena dens and then we'll head back towards the end of the sunrise safari. I reckless you were wondering on the subject of finding our leopards why we don't microchip them to make them easier to find. It's a question we often get. Um, the biggest answer is the value, for example, uh, with Sindile, the, the fact that they needed to keep track of him. So he's got a big collar on that helps, that sends out a GPS signal of his position, or at least used to send out a position of where he was at that particular time, where he was, what, not what he was doing, but probably what he was, if he was moving, if he was still, and so on. Now that has an immense value in terms of its research potential because it allows the vets to keep track of him and track his progress and his recovery now that he's been released back into the wild after eight months in quarantine. So you have to weigh up the benefits against the harm that it does to, or at least the, the level of interference that you have with that animal because putting a microchip in, it's not so easy. So what you have to do is you have to dart the animal which already carries with it a certain degree of risk. You cannot dart an animal, anaesthetize it, without risking that animal's life. It's, sometimes things go wrong just as it does with human beings when they have general anesthetic. And for the animal it then means a collar, which first of all is very, is clearly invasive for them and also secondly for an area that's as reliant as it is on tourism, looks terrible on the animal. It, 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 it's that sort of constant reminder or constant sort of message that these animals aren't wild when they are, they are of course completely wild but it doesn't appear that way to the tourists who come and view them. No, the other, the other alternative is you pop an abdominal tracker um, in, their, in their abdomen. Now that's even more invasive because you've got to cut the animal open. You cannot do it with females 
So we wouldn't be able to do it with Karula because of the, the uterus and the ovaries in that area. Can do it with males, but again, it's got very limited um, range in terms of signal because obviously it's in the abdominal cavity itself. And second of all, it's got a limited lifespan. So with collars and with the abdominal implants, their batteries run out, which means you've got to keep darting that animal, keep anesthetizing it, and you just increase the risk that you are exposing that animal to. Sometimes it's worth it, as it is with Sindile in terms of keeping track of him and the value that that research is bringing to the conservation societies. And sometimes it just isn't. And also for us, half of the joy, it's wonderful when you bump something. When you bump into something, it's that incredible sense of surprise. When you track and when you follow the signs, when you track and you follow the footprints and you actually find that animal on foot or after a couple of hours work, working for it somehow makes it even more rewarding. So we don't, we don't keep track of the animals like that. There are certain animals that are kept track of. Elephants, buffalo, there are some with sort of collars that give us positions or give the researchers positions and that's very valuable. But for us it's not something that we need and half of the fun is in the journey and the search for that animal. So while we journey on towards the old hyena dens, let's find out what Steph's journey entails. Welcome back and we've, uh, we've got two updates for you. One is we've arrived at the Cheetah Plains, and, uh, or at least anyway the most northern part of the Cheetah Plains. And secondly we've got an update on some lion activity for you, which is relatively interesting. And why I'm telling you this is because it seems like we have a new character in play. Mike, uh, one of the Cheetah Plains rangers, has just been past here and he says that right now, just before we got here, a male lion, a very skinny male lion, was here on the plain, saw them, and dashed away. Now that, that says to me is two things. One is that uh, this male lion is not part of the male coalition that holds this area, the Birmingham boys, because he wouldn't be that skittish and he wouldn't be that skinny if he was. And secondly, uh, not being comfortable around vehicles tells me that this male lion is from the Kruger most likely. Male lions that don't see a lot of cars or don't see cars at all are very skittish when they first see cars. And in particular, they'll be very skittish if they're on their own. Male lions like to be together. They, they, they like to form these coalitions. So a skinny male means that he's probably left his pride at some point. He's not capable of hunting that effectively just yet. He's mainly relying on what hunting he can do, but mainly scavenging and then not being part of a coalition and not knowing cars, which is quite exciting, you know. It's always nice to see and hear about these, these new nomads, these new characters. He's somewhere here. Uh, uh, Mike said to me that he was running away from the car towards the west and the northwest. He thinks that the, the line carried on going across this drainage line in front of us. However, one thing that I did spot, and which we're absolutely going to be doing some... Uh, some investigation on is in that direction there I'm just trying to think there we go just past the aerial in that direction thereabouts let's see if we can get them there we go are two vultures those look like white backed vulture now while it's not that uncommon to have vultures on a cold day like this sitting in a tree definitely says to me that I need to go and have a look at what they're there for. It's an outside chance, an off chance, that this male lion may have made a kill there or has scavenged a kill from something. He came then to drink some water here at this pan. That's when Mike found him. And now he's lying somewhere, hopefully feasting on whatever he's managed to steal there. He didn't, Mike didn't give me the impression that this male lion had anything in his belly. But it's definitely going to be something that I go and have a look at in the next couple of minutes. So we're going to head off there. Jamie has found a buffalo for you and I'll have some news for you in a bit. We have found the most extraordinary sighting and I wonder if you've spotted it yet. There we go, just that little bit of movement. This is so unexpected. It's so late in the season. Look at this. Brand new, still soaking wet. Look, it's still covered in the muck from its birth around the top of its back and its leg. 
Oh, little one. Welcome to the world. A brand, brand new buffalo calf. Isn't this just too special? Okay, little one, up you get. Up you get. Oh, it hasn't even worked out how to use its legs yet. But it's thirsty. Come on, Mum. Come on, Mum, you've got to encourage this little one up. There you go. Oh. Hello. There you go. Almost. Almost. Up a little bit. There's Mum. Mum is absolutely ancient. Sorry, that's not probably entirely fair. She probably doesn't appreciate that. But just look at her horns and her face. This is not a young buffalo cow. You can even see as she chews, you can even see the worn down state of her teeth. And she's done a phenomenal job of bringing this little baby into the world. Especially considering how little grass there is to eat. Most of the other buffalo have had their calves by now. She's had to finish off the final moments of gestation oh, with so little food. It's incredible what her body has put in to produce this little baby. There we go. Oh, almost. Come on. Up you get. A struggle as old as this area itself. There we go. Well done. Terribly wobbly little legs. Oh, lean against mom a little bit, lean against that tree. Oh, wow. This is so incredibly special. We've been looking for leopard cubs, but to see a baby buffalo take its first few wobbly steps. Oh, there you go, little one. No, no, that's not mom. That's not mom. That's a bull, little one. He's not going to appreciate that. No, no, he's really not going to appreciate that. No, no, that's... Oh, shame. Instincts kicking in. Just to let you know, for those of you who are sensitive, there is a very good chance that this male is going to lose patience with this baby very shortly. And I've seen it before, where it's been, where a young buffalo calf that's made this mistake has been kicked and trampled upon. So just be aware that that is a possibility, because at the moment, this little buffalo calf has definitely not found mom. Oh, little one. Oh, oh, oh. Careful, you're going to get kicked. Oh, mm, here we go. All right. For those of you who are sensitive, now would be the time to look away from your screens. I'll tell you when you can look back. I think that might be over. Oh, it's a harsh world. I think that's all done. Oh no, no, run little one, run little one. Come on boy, he just made a mistake. Just a baby, just a mistake. Come on mom, up you get. Shame, she's exhausted. Okay. The buffalo bull has turned away now, so for those of you who stopped watching, you can watch again. I'm not sure about whether that buffalo caused any injury to the calf, but it seems to be okay. It's on its feet. And now we need to hope that mom gets up so that this little calf starts feeding because it's hungry now. And that's why that happened. She moved away from the safety of the herd to give birth.
Okay, little one. Shame. You can see its back's arched. Very unstable and very, very hungry. And in this chilly winter, oh, it's still wet. Mom needs to give it a good clean. I think because of her age and because of the drought, she's struggling in terms of energy. This has just taken it out of her. She can't quite bring herself to stand up. She's exhausted. Girl, you poor thing. She's had this calf so late. Most of the other buffalo calves... Oh, oh. You might want to stop. Okay, that's okay. He's just lying down. I thought he was going to aim a kick at the calf. All right, little one. Here you go. Hello, little girl. It's a little female. I can gauge that just by the way that she's urinating. Oh, little one. And a sighting like this is both awe-inspiring and also a little bit terrifying. I'm really worried that the female is so exhausted that she's going to struggle to get up and feed the baby in the way that she needs to. She's very thin. She's not too thin though. She'll be okay. Come on, girl. Come on, you can do it. I know you're tired, but your little baby needs some warmth and some food. On this chilly winter's morning, a tiny baby like this needs to get dry as quickly as possible and I don't think she's had the energy that she would under normal circumstances to actually lick it clean and dry, which is why it's still sticky. And as you know, babies of any kind get cold very, very quickly. Oh, little one. This is brand new. This calf entered our world probably less than a couple of hours ago. I would say in the last two hours or so. Shame. And that was pure instinct telling it to go looking for food between a buffalo's back legs. Unfortunately, not going to have any success with that male. And that little calf was lucky that that injury wasn't, or that response wasn't worse. It's okay, it's just your mum. That's just your mum. Imagine that, your first few hours of life and that is your first lesson. Life is incredibly tough for these amazing animals. Luckily, nature has made them equally as tough. That's a bird, little one. It's going to be sitting on your back in the future, helping you out. Shame already the flies settling down and the baby not yet used to the sensation.